You bring up an interesting kind of side to it in your recent TED Talk about kind of what, what we're referring to as beneath the surface of competition. And I'm curious for starters, what, what kind of led you to pursue that a bit and want to learn more and talk more about it? Oh, that's a, that's a great question. It's such a good topic. I love that you had Tony and Wolf on first. They're two of the most competitive guys I have ever known, thankfully played with and never had to play against. <laughs> and, um, I, you know, really was starting to study philosophy. Once I started studying philosophy at Stanford, and then that's when I went to, you know, grad school. And if you, if, you, if, if I look back at this great time in my life where I was living in Long Beach, I was training for the, the 96 Olympics and on through 98, and I was in grad school studying philosophy and sports ethics. So I was reading and writing, and then in the morning working out, afternoon working out, and it was just this great conglomeration of like these two parts of me. And I started realizing I, I had, maybe for better or for worse, I had not noticed a lot of the nuance because I was just in the goal, trying to keep the ball out of the goal. <laughs> and now you've gotten heavily into this. And I think this is something that, especially as a younger player, you're, you're, you're maybe not thinking about uh, really kind of, the, kind of the mental side. And I think tapping into uh, a lot of your whys, right? Like why, yeah. why do you compete the way you do? And why do you act the way you do? And why are you someone that your opponent respects? Or why are you someone that gets a rep of, being the one who always fouls heavy on the perimeter for no reason. As you've explored that, what are, what are some of the important things you've learned? Yeah, boy, it's such a big, how long is this show? <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I gotta say it, it really, a lot of what I have come to do as a coach, I mean, I started coaching 21 years ago and, and I, I kind of came out quickly. I was not my plan. And I thought, boy, I need a foundation. And I've been studying a lot of Aristotle. And really what Aristotle is asking of us or, or urging us to do is not to follow some hard set of rules and say like, is this against the rules? Is that okay? Is that good? But, but sort of like, what kind of person do you want to be? And he talks about flourishing and what it means to flourish. And it's more than just winning games or losing games or following these rules and not following these rules. And it's truly sort of like, what kind of person do I want to be? What, what sort of athlete do I want to be? And the good news is you can be a really good competitive athlete and sort of like honor the game and play the game well. And so that was the, again, there's sort of the joining of those ideas for me. You know, it's so fascinating. And this happens all the time in sports. And we, we have a, obviously haven't seen it in a little while because we haven't had any live sports to look at but I can think of a number of examples where uh, there are these un unwritten rules in sports that get mowed down and you have people that have very hard feelings, one side or the other, an example being um, one team, and this just happened in college basketball earlier this year, one team is leading another team by 40 and they're just dribbling out the clock and someone steals the ball and takes it in for a dunk. And you have people that are on both sides of it. Yeah. Hey, the game is over. Why are you doing this? And the other person is saying, hey, I play this to the end. And, yep. and, and, that, and that leads me into your, this topic you've come up about what do you owe your competitor and this idea of like, what, what does it mean to really be a legitimate competitor and kind of understand all of these supposed right way to do things? Yeah, that's such a great question. And these are, these are things that I love about sports is people are emotional. And that's what it means to be a fan, right? A fanatic. You're, you're, it's, it's unconstrained zeal. Like on the one hand, we want that. And it makes it challenging to have these thoughtful conversations. And so the good news is we've got the catalyst. And to this exact point, I think what's great, I mean, what philosophers do well um, is they get to the, to the base of the question. And it's not running up the score is bad, you're bad, I'm good, or I play as hard as I can, you're bad, I'm good. It's, wait, there's a slight chance that we actually exactly agree on the foundation and it's manifesting differently. We might both be trying to honor the game and honor our competitors. One person's doing it by, you know, playing with their left hand or, you know, just passing the ball around and, and stopping it 20 to nothing. And another is doing it by playing the game as hard as they could. I, I um, actually, to this exact point, we were in a league for a long time and it was just, there was a massive disparity. We unfortunately had about 10 games a year that we, we could have won 50 to nothing. And we would play as hard as we could and then our second single would play as hard as we could. And then we, I tried to do something to sort of, I didn't want to have everyone playing with their left hand and, and embarrass the other team. So third quarter rolls around, we hadn't scored for about four minutes and the goalie on the other team who I'd worked with yelled in the middle of the game, Coach Jack, 
please play as hard as you can. We want the experience of playing a top team. <laughs> he wasn't calling <laughs> out. He was saying, please, like, we want to play your team because that's going to help us get better. So it's, it's a long-winded way of saying it, it's a great chance to come down to a, a conversation about a foundation. Yeah, that, you, you bring up a, a result like that made me think about the World Championships this past summer where I, where I believe Hungary defeated South Korea 64 to nothing. Right. And they, if you watch that game, they were, they were going for it. You know, they were, there was obviously a record to be, to be beat, but our women's national team, for example, like clockwork, they beat a team 21 to 2, 18 to 3, and right. without doubt the first few comments will be, well, where's the mercy rule? Why must they score that much? And to your point, what, what the average fan might not realize is that is them taking the gas all the way, you know, the right. foot all the way off the pedal. That it, it could be 65 nothing without much effort, but there is that balance of, you know, to your point, how, how do you be a good competitor while still competing? That's a hard thing to wrap your mind around. Right. I mean, that's the great thing. I mean, you and I touched on briefly, you know, the roots of competition are, and, and it seems counterintuitive, but truly to strive together, right? So it's this striving together to beat each other. And so there is a sense that if you and I go out and play tennis, I'm actually not sure what kind of game you've got on the courts, but okay. let's say, <laughs> so, so it looks like I, I have the potential to crush you in tennis then. Yes. But it, so, so in a sense, unless we agree on something else, there's a sort of tacit agreement, like I want you to give me your best. And I'm going to give you my best unless we decide, hey, you get double squirts and I get single squirts because we want it to be as fair as possible. Or I'll hit it right to you instead of trying to drive it down the line. And then that's a separate sort of agreement, but still the agreement's there. And that's, again, it's a, it's a little bit about allowing for a conversation to happen, which is sometimes is scary for people because you are taking a step deeper and there's a, a, a little bit of vulnerability there, which I think is a good thing, but it's, you know, by definition scary, but then you get to these real riches and that's, I mean, sport is just such a good catalyst for that. Now, so many of us spent the last five Sundays watching the last dance and the Michael Jordan documentary. And if that taught us anything, it's that you have to be ruthless to get, right. to, to get to where you want to be. And, and only the, you know, the real stone cold killers are the ones that, that won, you know, three championships in a row and then were able to do this and that. And that, that obviously works for some people, but, you know, you're working with younger athletes, whether it's high school club, you want people to be good, good teammates. That style does not work for everyone. You know, that's a one in a million sort of person that can match their demand with their ability right. and it be successful. Not, not everyone has that special mix. They have to find a different way. Yeah, and it's tricky. I used to, um, you know, Jim Thompson, who was the, the founder of Positive Coaching Alliance, who's just a tremendous person, has done amazing work in this area, as USA Water Polo knows. And we, we, we differed a little bit. I've now come back to where he was. I wanted to say, look, whatever, like the ethos of sports is the same, whether it's eight and under high school, professional. And he wanted to push back, saying, you know, not, not quite. Uh, and, and now I do think there's a really important difference, right? That like, and that's why I've stayed at the youth level, the high school level, the 18 and under level is I explicitly want it to be about something more than just winning games. Whereas when you're getting, you know, that money's on the line and you're getting paid to entertain and you're getting paid to win championships and you're adults. Again, it doesn't, it doesn't justify sort of this no hold bars approach, uh, but it, it's a different scenario, I think. And, and that's, that's, that's tricky for young people and for coaches because they're seeing that and they're thinking like, wait, am I supposed to emulate that? Or is there something else? And then again, it's a question of, you know, sort of a core values question where you have to come back and say, wait, we're going to establish our values and then we're going to act accordingly. In your TED talk, and, and you touched on this a bit in that, in that idea of, mimicking what you see someone else do and, and you address a couple of specific topics I think that do intertwine with water polo one the idea of, of kind of this flopping or simulation right which which has been a part of water polo for a long time we have if you've seen a game of water polo you have seen someone simulate a foul outside five and then look for the, the right. ref to give them something and potentially have the ball stolen from them and go the other way but you've also seen it work to their advantage they simulate a foul in a crucial moment. They get it, and they're able to score the shot outside five or now outside six. How does that get rationalized with being, yeah. being a, a legitimate, truthful competitor 
when sometimes that results in in the ultimate goal of winning or scoring the goal. Yeah, this is such a rich, I mean, it's one of my favorite conversations to have. I actually have this conversation every year in my ethics class. We spend an entire day on flopping or simulation. And, you know, it's really prominent in soccer. Obviously, it, it is part of the game of water polo. I mean, a, a lot of leagues, you know, it's explicitly in the rule books. Simulation is a foul. It's almost impossible to detect, right? A referee is trying to think, did this guy get touched or not? Because he is screaming, you know, the soccer player is writhing in pain. And the referee's like, ah, he must have been kicked. And it's just so interesting because you, you have this, these, these sort of two camps where one wants to say it's the, it's the formalist camp, where they want to say, wait a minute, if, it, if it's against the rules and, and you're wrongly punishing the defender, right, for something they don't deserve, and you're getting something that you therefore don't deserve, that's blatantly unethical. But the other side, again, like thoughtful philosophers, athletes, et cetera, say, whoa, like, who, who are you? What, you're a philosopher? Okay, anyway. Um, this sport, which is a you know human construct and is a culture unto itself, this is how it's played. It, soccer players flop, water polo players simulate, and so that's that's where the tension is, and I, and I think it's real tension. But but here's the way as as an, edu as an educator, or, you know, as a coach, that I solve this for my own players, and I think it makes them better players. This is where these two sides come together, and it it seems like a semantic twist, but it's actually a really important distinction. Instead of you hear coaches yelling, you got to draw a foul. And then you see the players, right? Where they're, they're spinning the ball and they're ducking their head. Did, <laughs> did I draw it, right? Did I draw it? Get the word draw out of your vocabulary and tell them to earn a foul. And now you're protecting the ball. You're making a water polo move. If they don't foul you, you just got inside water. They better do something to prevent you from moving. And what that something is, contact, you release the ball, you have earned a foul. That, that's one of the few philosophical puzzles I think I've solved. <laughs> very nice, very nice. <laughs> uh, author, public speaker, coach, former uh, Lawrence water polo player. You, you, you have a couple of these, you know, you said, and it's so true, really rich discussion topics where, you know, these, these could be full, full day discussions where you really debate it. But uh, in talking with Tony earlier, and he talked about their road to the podium in Beijing. And one of the most notable things about that was that there was a feeling that Serbia lost one of their group play games in an effort to set up a match with Team USA later in the tournament. Yeah. And then the United States ends up putting on one of the all-time great matches in their history and, and really hammers Serbia to get forward in the tournament. And it's so interesting to think about that because from the U.S. standpoint, you say, well – how fitting is this? You you tried to game the system. Oh, yeah. Look at what you got. But in other instances, you know that that has worked quite well for teams where they have done the math. And, and to your point, this is all part of the constructs of this event. We yeah. are allowed to do what we have to do to set up yeah. the scenario we'd like. What's what's wrong with that? Boy, uh, it does. The question of integrity comes in. And, you know, FINA has it in their, in their rules. You must honor the integrity of the game of the Olympic spirit is you must always give best efforts. So in the way that you think, wait a minute, you're trying, to, you're explicitly trying to not throw the ball into the rectangle. You're trying to miss the rectangle. <laughs> That's not best efforts. And you could imagine a coach like thoughtfully, not in a coy manner coming back and saying, I am truly like under the auspices of this endeavor, giving our best efforts. We've scouted everyone. We're giving our best efforts under these quirky rules to win this medal. And so I think at that level, it seems to be more justifiable. Whereas at the youth level, and there are many opportunities where losing a game makes sense, whether it's to get a certain seed in a playoff or in a tournament to move out of the bracket. Um, I think there you're running into real trouble where now you're saying, hey kids, we're gonna intentionally lose. And the kids are now scratching their heads like, I, I don't understand coach. I thought we were here just to, to be our best not just do what it takes when it all costs so we can get like a trophy at the end of the day. So, I mean, that boy, that that's a, such a fun conversation to have. And I'm in the midst of it myself. Yeah. You know, and it, and it also feels like um, in a way a coach or a program has devised maybe the smartest way to advance through a tournament. So it isn't necessarily yeah. that they're, you know, because their best effort might find them winning all of the games that are in front of them. But they've decided to take more the more the mental approach. To your point, that hey, if we 
ease off in one of these games, it's going to be more advantageous to us uh, as opposed to trying trying our hardest physically. Absolutely. I mean, teams, professional teams, you know, a baseball team, you know, secures the, the division title. They get to rest their starters. Their pitchers are pitching, you know, one every nine games instead of one every five. They're getting, you know, they've sort of earned the right to rest those players. So they're explicitly not giving best efforts. They're, but, but they also are. They're saying, no, we are. We worked our tails off. We secured the division. And now we're giving best efforts to win this next set of games so it it becomes you know it, it's philosophers get a bad rap because it's sort of like it depends what you mean by is right going back a few years <laughs> but, but, it, but it actually does like we have to talk about what it what, what does it mean to give best efforts and that's a legitimate conversation to have how how often or how much have you dug into the idea of almost un, unintentional consequence right because you you make one of these moves on the chessboard where I'm not going to win this game because I think that this provides the best path forward, or we have a game against the best team in two weeks, but we're playing them tonight, and I will run a different lineup yeah. so that I give a different look for them. But yeah. unintentionally, I motivate that team to a level that they have not previously known. I think sometimes you, you have a thought about something and you make a move, and it's almost like that's very, you know, that butterfly effect, right? It's like you do something here, and then over here, you have now lit a fire that you didn't previously know how to light. Right. Yeah, and that's where, and that's where this all gets really interesting, because now we're talking about ethics, and we're talking about you know, honoring the game, and being your best, and winning, and now we're getting into sort of like the psychology of gamesmanship, <laughs> which absolutely, I mean, think about the, the penalty shot example. I mean, Tony and I were just watching a game between the, the women when they beat Italy in that super final game, which was just an awesome match, and right out of the gates, there's a penalty shot. The Italian goalie is sitting there floating at like three meters. You know, just, and the United States shooter answers and says, oh, okay, well, I'm going to let the ball go. Now the referee can't even start this because now I'm in control. Then the yeah. goalie has to be back. Then the shooter gets the ball. Then the goalie creeps out. So it's this whole cat and mouse. So I think your question uh, is especially interesting because um, what I wouldn't want is for someone to approach this purely philosophically and theoretically because we don't live in theory. We, we are interacting with humans and there's this sort of game theory at place where once you find out how I've gamed the system, that's gonna change the stakes. We're talking with Jack Bowen. We're talking philosophy, ethics around competition, all part of our competition week. If you have any questions, feel free to drop them in the comments. You, you talk uh, too about the idea about taunting and this has really gotten into various levels over the years where is it taunting? Is it is it part celebration? I think of the professional uh, football, the National Football League, and for years, if you made any sort of gesture in the end zone, right, right. it was a flag. You were showing people up. They realized that people wanted to see a little bit of celebration, you know. So they they eased up, and now you see, you know, there's there's a lot more leeway for choreographed routines, and it comes back to that idea. Well, if you don't want to see that sort of celebration, then keep that person out of the end zone. But it does, you know, it does get to a point, right, where it's not, it's not celebrating, right? It is, it is trying to incite anger in, in your opposition or the opposing right. coach. And that's an interesting line to walk as well. Yeah. And, and again, I think this question is great because it comes, there's a little bit of an intent issue here, right? That if I block your shot and I go to your face and yeah, like I'm blatantly taunting you and like, that's not. That's not respecting you, but you yeah. know, like you watch, man, you watch Meryl Moses play and he blocks a shot and he is pouring energy into his team. I mean, he's just, it's almost like, I want to be like, wait, Meryl, you don't use all, or, or where do you get all that energy? Like <laughs> save it, save it. But he's like, you know, pouring energy into his team. And there's different, when, when I made a big save, I would, it's the opposite of Meryl. I'd go underwater, like, it didn't even matter and come up and just like, let's press, you know, just, just like, what? I made an amazing save. So again, there's a little bit of sort of psychology and gamesmanship, but, um, and it, it also relates to the culture. I mean, think about, you know, when, when Bryce Harper hits a home run and a huge game to put the, the nationals up by run and he does, you know, this with his back. Yeah. To show a little bit of joy and just gets lambasted, right? Like they say, like, I can't believe that he would show the pitcher up. And in baseball, you actually have to know, going back to your initial comment, there's an unwritten rule that if you flipped your bat in the air after doing this amazing feat, what, what you're actually doing is showing the pitcher up. And 
an outsider's might want to say, goodness, you're, you mean you're not allowed to celebrate at all? So it's just tricky because now you're bringing in another factor, this, this factor of culture and like how that relates to everything that we're doing. Yeah, for example, and, and because there was no baseball, the Korean Baseball League has got a lot of airtime lately on ESPN. Right. And bat, bat flipping is another category yep. there. They're like everybody bat flips. It is, it is in no way deemed – showing up the pitcher because every home run results in a different elaborate bat flip. And so right. it's gotten to the point where nobody views that to your point, the way that a Bryce Harper does it now, now it's very old school. You're being shown up. Right. Yeah. And again, it's, it's a little bit of a, it's a cult, the culture of the sport thing and certain different teams, you know, UCLA, you know, last year, their team, when they scored done, get back to half, get your hips up. Don't, that that never happened. You got you got defense to focus on. That's one you know somewhat intimidating r approach and good good psyche. Whereas other teams want to say, wait a minute, we want to be a little more free flow. And part of that is just really important, and especially at the at the youth sports age to understand like what it is you're actually doing. We're talking with Jack Bowen here and talking about com uh, competition all week long, competitive nature about kind of the ethics, some of the, some of the thoughts behind that. We've talked a lot about the kind of the player um, side of it, but coaches too, right? Coaches give, give important examples. Uh, they, can, they can cross the line. They can not be honoring their fellow coach across the pool, their opponent in the water. And that's vital too because the players are often looking to the coach, right, for the ultimate yeah. guidance. Yeah, absolutely. And, I, you know, I – all of my non-league games or who I invite to tournaments, I'm inviting programs. I'm inviting coaches and programs who I know see the game the way that I see it. Not, not are they good or bad, because there's some really darn good teams that we play against that have coaches that are really serious about professionalism and treating each other with respect, and they are out there to throttle you, right? So <laughs> and that's, that's kind of what we're looking for. It's, it's um, I guess I can – I can share this bit now because I've already written on it. Um, the very first blog I wrote six years ago was, hey, here's this unethical thing that I did as a coach at Menlo School. Right? And Santa Clara was like, whoa, wait, um, we're, we're asking you to, to be the guy who's in charge of sports ethics. You're, you're saying that, and I said, I said two things. First of all, I, I don't want this to be me up here, like I'm good, you're bad. Like this is a journey, like we're all in this together. Um, the instance was, um, we were playing against Miramani in what was considered the state tournament at the time that Bellarmine hosted. It was, it was to, it was the, to get into the semifinal game, one goal game, the Miramani player on offense made a move. As he was making the move, I could see the water splashed over his ears and the referee calls an offensive, but I could see he didn't know what the call was. So I immediately yell, I'm standing right next to him and my defender. And I yell to my player, Alex, it's his free pass back up, let him have his free pass, which was a, which was wrong. It was yeah. an offensive. It was our ball. So the Miramani player like looks to me, the adult educator who he's taught to respect, picks the ball up, passes it, gets ejected. Jack, we, um, we think that was unethical. I'm like, are you kidding? We talk in the bus right home. And I'm like, yeah, wow. Like that, that was, that was me taking advantage of a power position and not honoring that player. So again, when you as a coach allow yourself to be part of the part of that culture, um, then it really does become something that everyone's buying into. Talking with Jack Bowen here, just, just a couple of more minutes. We, we did get a question that came in. How much has your outlook on youth sports and ethics changed in your coaching career? And I know you touched on this a bit as you were getting involved in PCA, but what's that um, evolution been like for you over, over time? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I mean, I, um, like I said, before getting to the national team, I hadn't really taken sort of like the ethics and the philosophy of sport that seriously. I mean, I had a great Randy Burgess was my high school coach. He yanked me out of a game once for taunting a player when I caught the lob shot. I saw Chris Duplanty do it at the tournament in Hawaii. He caught the lob <laughs> shot. He's like, get that out of here. I was like, ooh, that's cool. I'm going to do that. And I did it in the middle of the game. Burgess calls a timeout, yanks me out. And I was like, oh, Lesson learned. Okay, so there's other <laughs> stuff going on here, um, but what it's what it's shown me is really um, a, a richness to the game that 
I had never like really realized. Like I, I love the strategy of water polo. Like Tony and I just broke down a front court offense. It took us 15 minutes to get through the nuance of one front court offense. So I've always loved that. And then when you pile on like the human condition on top of that, A, it makes the whole endeavor that much richer. And B, it also, I realized that sport becomes this like ideal catalyst for doing what I want to do, which is get a really big picture topic, which as a philosopher, people very often just, they don't want to do, but all of a sudden now we're just talking sports and you're having these great conversations. Jack, as, as we wrap things up here, you know, just, just one last question for you. As we've gone through all this stuff, you know, if you're the, if you're the average water polo person popping into this stuff and they haven't heard you speak before or read your stuff, it might feel a touch heavy to them. They might say, wait, this is not a, you know, usual six on five breakdown, that sort of thing. If, if someone was just going to, you know, pause and, and think for a little bit or kind of have, you know, one, one moment of self-reflection, what's, what's something you'd want or that you think is important for people to kind of reflect on as, as far as how they carry themselves in sport? So two things. Um, one for coaches, I think, as I wrote in a blog about two years ago, what do you want your players to think about you 20 years from now? Because a lot of times like our banquets, I mean, I literally have cried at every, the all 21 end of season banquets and players are crying. Coach was great. We came together. We achieved. Um, and that's super meaningful, but what's more meaningful are, I'm, and I've now coached for 21 years. So I've had, you know, two cohorts of groups come back and we've got to check in. And, and those reports, as they've gotten to see things with the bird's eye view, that's, that's the lens. What are my players going to be saying about me or a coach in 20 years? And as an athlete, I mean, I think I'm going to, you know, I started with Aristotle. I'll go back to Aristotle, but like, what kind of person do I want to be? Or in, in the realm of water polo, like what kind of player do I want to be? And I think just letting that question be a real question that you have complete authorship over and that's a really fun question to grapple with too have you asked any of those kids the ones that are now you know out 20 years 21 years from from having been coached by you what what the you know what the memory is or what comes to mind to kind of answer your own question yeah it's funny a couple guys did reach out and they're like look i know it's only 19 years but you know one guy's starting a, a startup company here in silicon valley and he said one of our core, you know, the core mantra is be your best. And he's like that, what we did when I was 16 has resonated in every facet of my life. And I'm just like, oh my gosh, this is so good. And he didn't really talk. We, we won CCS. It was actually the first, that was the first year in school history that we won the CIF title. I don't recall him mentioning any of the, we had a couple amazing, like sudden death overtime games, sudden victory, sorry. Um, I didn't, he didn't mention any of that. So I think like, it's a good reminder as a coach um, you know, what it is that we're, that we're doing. Well, you, I mean, you, you played this game long enough and, and, and we're at the higher enough levels to be, to be one of those athletes that, you know, has had to embrace the journey as so many of the national team and college athletes talk about, right. And you ask most of your teammates, right. I'm sure the medals and, you know, the wins and all that stuff stand out, but so many of your peers will talk about more like this miscellaneous moment in time yep. from way back yep. when, that has now influenced everything they do in life going forward. And that to me is always so fascinating. Yeah, it's funny. I just got interviewed. They've got this great write up on like the best 10 college water, top 10 college water polo teams in history. And, and my junior year was selected as the number nine team. And he called and interviewed. He said, tell me about that team. I was like, gosh, I'm trying to think of some stuff, but I just remember a lot of joy. I remember being with Wolf and Frank Schneider and Jeremy Laster and Dante, and it was playful and it was joy. I mean, yeah, we worked our tails off, but it was joyful. And like, and I'm so happy, I, you know, that I, that was my answer. I had never actually intentionally thought about that. So to your exact point, that's, that's what we're aiming for. One, one other question, you know, it's like you're giving me more good stuff and now I'm thinking of other good questions <laughs> here, but you, the uh, the high school student that had, was starting the company, you know, 20 years later, right? He's talked about kind of one of your values. You you went after all these things in sport and after, and after all these things in coaching, whether it's titles and victories and all that sort of stuff. But, you know, now now for you is the, you know, is the biggest impact you have when someone come, comes back to you and, you know, can kind of speak to the impact you had on their life. Is that is that what you're after now, you know, as you've embraced this mental side of it? A hundred percent. I mean, I, there, there's no doubt I'm competitive. I mean, I, you could ask my wife and I come home after a tough, a tough loss. Like that, that, that means a lot. Like I am striving to win, but I mean, that's, that's actually part of the reason I've intentionally stayed 
at the high school level. It's just such a sweet spot. And I'm at a school that values the same things we value. And we win, you know, the league championship for whatever the 18th time, the headmaster or the athletic director are mentioning all these other things aside from like the shiny medal or the trophy, right? And like, if you look at what USA Water Polo or Cap 7, like they're honoring all of these other things. They're not just only celebrating the trophies and the gold medals. Those are hugely important. I mean, what, what the women keep doing at the Olympics is amazing and should be celebrated. But also, I mean, like I use Adam a lot in my talks and he's a friend of mine and I respect him as a coach as well. Not, not just did they win a gold medal, how did they do it? And, and that's the kind of thing that, like I said, like my school, this organization, you know, Cap7 who sponsors a lot of what I do with goalies. And then you, get, you kind of get to choose what you celebrate. And there's just, there's so much big stuff as we, you know, the people in charge know. It's hard, like it's hard to see that when you're 16, but we know it and we get a chance, a rare chance to sort of disseminate that. Jack, good stuff as always. Always a pleasure to talk with you. Thanks for uh, taking some time here to chat with us and share some of your wisdom. That was great. Thanks so much, man. Thanks for having me. Thanks for all the little floating hearts. Very distracting, but I accept. That was great. Thank you. <laughs>